We are very privileged to have uh, Peter Gutman uh, from New Zealand here today for our uh, technical uh, keynote. Uh, he is a researcher in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Auckland, uh, working on crypto. Uh, he helped write the popular PGP encryption package uh, as well. Uh, and here he's going to talk today about um, bomb fuses uh, and bomb disposal. So let's welcome Peter Goodman to the stage. Thanks. Okay, so the thinking process behind bombing is uh, you want to cause disruption, and bombing basically causes disruption. Um, also, blowing stuff up is fun. The general process behind it is you load the bombs in at the source, you freight it over to your destination, you drop it on your destination, and profit. So that's the general theory. However, um, you can revise that because you really want to cause disruption and blowing stuff up, okay, that's one way of causing disruption, but unexploded bombs or UXBs can also cause disruption because if you've got a thousand pound unexploded bomb under some critical installation, no one can go near that until the thing's been defused. Um, one example was an unexploded bomb that went under the NPL, National Physics Lab in Teddington, which in the UK was a critical um, war research establishment. Um, took 9,800 man hours to defuse. This was imperial measurements, so you had yards and pounds and feet and man hours. Um, so the fact that this thing didn't explode was at least as disruptive as if it had exploded. Um, and during World War II and also during the Vietnam War, both the Germans and the Vietnamese became very, very good at repairing bomb damage very quickly. So you'd bomb some place like a runway and within 24 hours they'd have it patched up. They'd paint fake bomb craters over the patches so it looked like it was still destroyed and they'd have um, planes taking off over the same runway. So simply having bombs that detonate immediately um, isn't necessarily as disruptive as having bombs that sit there and don't detonate. So you've got additional considerations with unexploded bombs. Um, the defenders can take as long as they want to disarm the thing. So they can sit there and take whatever time they want, use whatever machinery they want to try and disarm this thing. So you take two approaches to combat this. Um, the first one is you make the bomb very hard to disarm. And the second one is you rig the thing so it kills the people trying to disarm it. Traditional bomb fuses were chemical and all mechanical, and these things go back to at least the 1890s. You had these incredibly complicated mechanical contraptions. Um, and then if you look at the function of a fuse, there's basically two functions. The secondary purpose is you want to make the thing detonate when it's supposed to. That's the secondary purpose. The primary purpose is you want to make sure it doesn't detonate when it's not supposed to. You don't want the thing detonating when you're handling it, when you're loading it, when it's fired, or whatever. You only want it to detonate once it reaches its target. So during World War II, the Japanese actually had the lowest percentage of duds because they didn't bother with safety mechanisms. Um, if you've got something that just blows up in your face, then yeah, it's relatively reliable in blowing up in your face, although you'd rather have it blow up in someone else's face. Um, and there's these great quotes if you read sort of military history books and things like that. Um, this one that's up on the screen at the moment. It, it's not a wholly sound mechanism. In some instances, it was quite dangerous for the operator. This is a US Army um, field manual on Japanese military equipment. Um, so there are two main models of hand grenades, the Model 91 and the Model um, 97. And in both cases, it said, and the italics are in the original, throw immediately since action of fuse is sometimes erratic. So the way the Japanese fuses work, if you're familiar with, um, there's basically two general types of grenades that people are familiar with from films. There's the standard style. You pull the pin out, you release the spring loader catch, you throw it. And then you've got the German stick grenade. You unscrew the cap and you pull this um, lanyard and then you throw it. The Japanese ones, um, you pulled out some sort of safety pin, you then smashed the fuse down on a rock and you threw it. So one of, two, one of three things would happen with these because they had really unreliable fuses. You smash it down on a rock and it blows up before you can throw it, killing you and everyone around you. Or you smash it down on a rock and you throw it and it blows up once it reaches the enemy. And the third option is, yeah, you throw it and it doesn't blow up and the other side picks it up and throws it back at you and then it blows up killing you. So one out of three isn't that bad for, for, you know, for a weapon like that. Um, and then they had this guy, um, Kijiro Nambu, who's, he's been called the Japanese John Browning, although I think that's a completely wrong designation. Um, because John Browning designed his stuff about 100 years ago, and a lot of it's still in use today, whereas nothing this guy designed um, was used after about August 1945. He, he, one, one military historian said this guy designed comically bad weapons. Um, so one of his first designs was an Nambu Type 14 pistol. Um, this thing has no safety catch. So what actually happened was, in, in the late 19th century, he went on a tour of Europe and looked at some of the weapons they were doing there. And back then, the state of the art was the Mauser C96 pistol, also known as the broom-handle Mauser. Um, 
So this was pretty much the state of the art for that time. There were a bunch of experimental pistols or semi-automatic pistols done about that time, but the Mauser was the first sort of mainstream production model that was ready for general use. And the Chinese just built about a bazillion unlicensed copies of this thing and then probably sold them on AliExpress as guaranteed 100% original pistols. Whereas the Japanese got this guy to design his own version of it. Um, as far as I know, this is the only production semi-automatic pistol ever that's been produced without a safety catch. He decided there just wasn't any use for one. So you could actually fire this thing without pulling the trigger, um, for example, while clearing one of the frequent jams. It was also a horribly unreliable pistol. So in response to this thing, um, the principal complaint with the IJA, the Imperial Japanese Army, was that it has no safety catch and our guys are shooting themselves trying to clear the jams in this thing. You'd think that would also be a problem, but apparently the main thing was a safety catch. So instead of you know, giving this guy a short sword and telling him to nip around the back and you know what to do with this, they said, design more weapons for us based on this amazing pistol. So he designed this, the Type 94 Nambu pistol. This was the main Japanese officer's pistol during World War II. It is generally acknowledged as the worst production handgun ever produced. That was the main Japanese sidearm during World War II. So, and you know, that's, that's kind of an impressive feat because no two people can agree on what the best handgun is. No one person can agree on what the best handgun is, but the consensus is this is the worst handgun ever produced. So, um, the, the, the feature that gives it that prize is, let's look at some of the other stuff. First of all, it is horribly ugly. It looks like it was made by some guy with a grinder and a file. And this was a, you know, an early war model, which was a mass production one. Towards the end of the war, they probably were made with a grinder and a file. Um, it's chambered for this underpowered eight millimeter round, also designed by Nambu. So he was an incompetent weapons designer and an incompetent ammunition designer. Uh, it had a six round clip, so it was the same as a revolver. Um, it was mechanically clunky, it was unreliable, it was badly engineered. It was just an awful weapon. But the thing that, that you know, gives it the prize of the worst handgun ever designed is, actually I'll go back a bit, if you look above the, I'm not sure how obvious it is, above the pistol there's that bar there, which is an exposed sear bar. So if you press down on that, the pistol fires without pulling the trigger. Um, there's lots of demos of this. People love to demonstrate this because you, know, you, you sort of make fun of this thing. So that's someone firing the pistol with his finger nowhere near the trigger. So if you've got this thing and it's loaded, and you holster it or you put it down on your table, on a table, or you're cleaning it or whatever, you can fire it. Um, this, there's a persistent, but as far as I can tell, completely unfounded rumor that calls this a suicide pistol because Japanese officers, when they were surrendering, they would hand it over to Americans like this and the American would then pick it up um, and press down on the sear and shoot someone. Um, some more examples of stuff this guy designed. I'll, I'll get back onto bomb fuses in a minute, but just, this is, this is something else he designed. It's a Type 11 machine gun. It looks like a cross between like a combine harvester and a sewing machine. It's just, it's an unbelievable weapon. If you're interested in this, either talk to me afterwards or go and look at it on YouTube. It's, it's, no one's ever designed anything like this before or since. Uh, but the main point is you really do want safety features on your weapons. You do not want, um, you know, someone where you can shoot yourself in the foot simply by putting it down on the table or holstering a pistol. So mechanical fuse designs are really, really difficult to make both reliable and safe. You want something that detonates um, once it reaches its target, but not when it's being fired or when it's being handled. And in the case of this, for example, this is a German um, Mark 108 cannon fuse, a 30 millimeter fuse. So this is gonna be used in air-to-air -air combat, typically over Germany. So you want something that doesn't detonate when it's fired, it detonates if it hits its target, but if the thing then falls onto the ground over one of your cities, you don't want all these 30 millimeter shells detonating all over your city. And so what this one does, it's got this incredible series of mechanical safety features. I'm not sure how obvious it is from that diagram, how, how visible it is, it is on that, but the two things are, right at the top, there's a ring of six ball bearings. So as the shell is fired, it starts spinning, and the force of that spinning then forces these six ball bearings outwards, and so they free the path for the firing pin. And down below that, that sort of dark, those two dark bands, that's a um, collar that's also forced open by the force of the spinning. So once the thing's in flight, it's spinning at high speed, these two sets of mechanical interlocks are moved out of the way. The firing pin can then um, be pushed down when it hits the target. If it misses the target, it falls back down to earth, it stops spinning, those mechanical interlocks lock back into place, and once it hits the ground, it can't detonate anymore. That's a pretty ingenious design. You know, it's a purely mechanical fuse, which makes sure that it will, the thing will detonate on impact with the target, but won't detonate when it hits the ground. However, this thing is being fired out of a cannon and it's been accelerated at hundreds of Gs. So you've got all these very fine mechanical devices which may or may not function reliably with that kind of shock. That's a larger, more modern fuse used in an artillery shell. Again, entirely mechanical. Um, 
And it's got a bunch of safety features. So first of all, it's got a cap over the top. So before you actually fire the thing, you remove the cap. So if you accidentally hit the fuse, there's no, or the, the, you know, the firing pin or anything like that, there's no problem. And this is, because it's larger, you've got more safety features in it. So, and again, I don't sure how obvious it is on the diagram, but when it's fired, there's this frangible link um, in the top that, shat that breaks away from the firing shock. So it shatters and that frees the firing pin so it can travel down. And it's got a second feature down at the base, these two cams also activated by the shell spinning. And the cam then rotates the primer into place beneath the firing pin. So if it's not fired, if you simply drop it, the primer is nowhere near the firing pin. Even if the firing pin somehow gets pushed down, it's not gonna hit the primer. Once it's spinning, the cams rotate into place and the primer is then underneath the firing pin. When it impacts on the target, it detonates. But again, you've got all these very fine mechanical components that have to deal with a massive amount of shock when they're fired and also being spun at an insanely high speed and, and not fall apart or shatter or break. So it is very, very difficult to, reliable, to build both reliable shells uh, and ones that are safe. In World War I, the, Amer the, the shells the Americans supplied under Lend Lease, about one third of all American shells supplied to the British were duds because they couldn't actually just build them safely. So Germany carried out extensive electronic uh, trials on fuses in 1931 and 32. Um, by the Treaty of Versailles, they were forbidden from developing a whole bunch of different weapons, including this kind of stuff. So they started in secret in 1926. Um, and they did the testing in secret in Russia. So Russia was, at that time, was Bolshevik Russia, and they had no friends anywhere because they were Bolsheviks and no one liked them. And so they had this, the Treaty of Rapallo with Russia. And because Germany was basically a pariah and Russia was a pariah, uh, they collaborated in doing this weapons testing. So the one place where Germany could safely test weapons was in, in Soviet Russia. And they tested 250 mechanical fuses and 250 electronic fuses, and they found the electronic fuses were vastly superior. And they also had the advantage that they had the Spanish Civil War, um, where they assisted, this, assisted um, Franco. And they basically used that as a testing ground for their fuses. So they had a fuse called the Type 15 fuse, which was the precursor to the one they used during World War II, and got to test that extensively. And it was a relatively benign war because they weren't fighting anyone with significant military capabilities and they had safe airfields and they could go in and retrieve the fuses and see what happened. Um, so they basically did the live testing of their fuses during the Spanish Civil War. So a traditional bomb fuse is in the nose of the bomb. Uh, with an electronic fuse, you don't need to do that anymore. There's no mechanical connection. You, know, you don't rely on the fuse actually impacting the ground. You can have it in the side of the bomb. And so, tip, so what they did there is they have huge fuse pockets in the side of the bomb and the fuses went into that. The other thing is because it's now an electronic fuse, you haven't got the single point of contact where the, um, the bomb hits the ground. So you can put in multiple fuses. So a lot of the bombs had two fuse pockets for two different types of fuses. And you can mix and match different fuses. So the general form of a bomb fuse um, is, that's about the size of a fuse um, to give you a scale for that sort of thing. So when this, when this was inserted in the fuse pocket, so you had a um, pocket in the side of the bomb that was about that thickness. So the armorer would take the fuse. This is a, effectively it's an inert fuse. This is purely the electronic side of things. So the way the detonation chain worked, the bomb itself was swilled with amatol, which is the standard military explosive. It's a mixture of ammonium nitrate and uh, TNT. And it's a perfect military explosive. It's insensitive, it doesn't degrade, it doesn't absorb moisture. Um, it's very shock immune. So you can, for example, fire a bullet into it and it shouldn't detonate it. Um, you can set fire to it, you can do all sorts of stuff, and it's very, very safe to handle. But because it is so hard to detonate, um, you need a very strong explosive charge to actually detonate the thing. So the way the fuse works, you've got the basic fuse, that's the electronic component. Um, you've then got something called a primary explosive, which is a very sensitive explosive, which is why you don't generally um, use this in your main bombs. And that screws into the base of the standard fuse, so that's detonated by the fuse. Um, that's about the same explosive charge as a hand grenade. So the fuse fires the primary explosive, the primary explosive is easy to set off, but relatively weak. So around that, you've got a secondary or booster explosive, um, which amplifies the shock of the primary enough to actually detonate the TNT, which is relatively immune to shock. So you've got these three stages of the explosive train. So what the armorer would do is they would, um, this thing is called the gain, so that would, that which amplifies the explosive charge. So they would take this, drop in the epitric acid, which is the booster explosive, drop this into the fuse pocket and screw down a locking ring. And at that point, the bomb is armed. So you've got two parts of the arming mechanism. The top part is the bomb rack in the aircraft, and the lower part is the actual fuse which goes into the bomb. And the, um, it's electrically armed, so the, you've, got a, you've got a selector switch in the cockpit where they can select the fuse delay and a bunch of other things. 
So the thing with this is the army contacts are only engaged once the bomb has left the bomb rack. Um, what that diagram shows, that zigzag thing at the top, is these arming contacts which are held in place like this. And once the bomb drops down out of the fuse rack, and it's left, so once it's dropped the bomb rack, it makes momentary contact and it puts a pulse of electrical energy into the bomb. So the feature with this is, with a standard bomb, you can get an armed bomb sitting in your, in your bomb rack and it's stuck, one of the lugs hasn't detached. And so you then have to land your aircraft with an armed bomb um, in the aircraft. And that has happened and aircraft have been destroyed by particularly Japanese aircraft were notorious for this again because they had no safety mechanisms. Um, you basically ended up with a kamikaze aircraft because you couldn't safely land this thing. So you pretty much had to crash it into something in order to, de to get rid of the bomb. So again, that was, an, that was a really impressive safety feature. If you compare this with mechanical fuses, um, you were guaranteed that this thing was only armed once it had already dropped out of the bomb rack. So you, you were pretty much, we're not gonna have the case we've got an armed bomb sitting in a bomb rack. And the last section of the uh, mechanism is the fuse in the bomb. So this is a two-stage thing. Initially, when you get this pulse of current going into this bomb, it goes into storage capacitors. So they absorb the initial current pulse. You've then got resistors that it leaks through into arming capacitors. And there's a certain delay while it leaks through those resistors, which is the arming time of the bomb. Again, you don't want this bomb to be live the minute it leaves the bomb rack. You want to have a couple of seconds delay so it gets well clear of the plane before it goes live. Um, they then go into the firing capacitors and the firing capacitors, there's trembler switches in there. So when it hits the ground, the trembler switches causes a short and then it fires the actual fuse. Um, yeah, so the time for the charge to leak from the initial storage capacitors into the arming capacitors is the arming time. And the igniters themselves, there's three different igniters which can be set by the armorer. So there's, um, there's a screw in here where when the bomb is actually initially set, you can set the screw. Um, to allow it to detonate immediately or to have a delayed detonation because you don't necessarily want it to detonate immediately on this. If it detonates as soon as it hits the surface, there's a huge amount of blast but not much damage. You want it to detonate once it's penetrated into the ground and destroy the structure that it's hit. Um, so most of the circuitry in this thing is actually to prevent accidental detonation, not to ensure detonation. These fuses are incredibly safe. The bombs could actually be transported in the armed state. Um, that's an SC-250, which is a 250 kilogram bomb. Um, and the fiatic on the side means it's armed. So that's a fully armed bomb being shipped in its case because the fuse is safe enough that you can actually transport it in that state. With a mechanical fuse, there's no way you could ever do that. This is the standard fuse used throughout the war. Um, it's, a, it's a 25B, so um, that's, that's the mainstream fuse used everywhere. Um, this is a development of the Type 15 fuse. So the 15 was the one that they more or less tested during the Spanish Civil War, and the 25B was their standard fuse. Um, so the selector fuse and the switch, which are set by the armorer, uh, enables or delays a short delay circuit. So you've got these detonation delay options. As I said, there's an instantaneous, which typically isn't used. There's short um, one second. So it basically penetrates some distance into the structure. And then there's a relatively long one, 17 seconds. So it sits there and it comes to rest and then it detonates. Um, and some of these things, you can also do things, for example, if you're doing low level bombing, you don't want instantaneous detonation because you're going to knock out the aircraft. So in that case, you'll set the 17 second delay so the aircraft has got time to get clear um, before the bomb detonates. And again, this is the, the, the flexibility of these electronic fuses. And you could set them to do all sorts of interesting things that want, wasn't so easy with mechanical fuses. The physical layout was, um, you've got trembler switches which actually activate the thing. Um, and I've already mentioned things like this. So that's the gain, which contains uh, nitropenta. It's still used today in primer cord, uh, which is um, fuse cord. Um, and I've m I mentioned the explosive train, so that triggers the picric acid and that actually detonates the TNT. And the electronics are pitted in bitumen, so, and it's all passive components. So there's no transistors, there's no valves, there's nothing like that in there. It's purely passive components. And they're extremely shock insensitive because the whole thing's potted in bitumen. Now about half a century later, um, that was kind of the state of the art in fuses, the Mark 376 electronic fuse. The thing about this is, this is basically a Mark II. The first one developed was the Type 15. They had a few teething problems. They developed the Type 25B, and that was, you know, the, the second development of the fuse. This one, the Mark 376, these 376 revisions that they went through of this fuse to get into that state. And the problem with that, it basically does exactly the same thing as a 25B, but they use transistors and all sorts of other fancy components. And the problem is you've now got these, you know, sensitive components and you have to add safety circuitry to deal with the fact that these transistors can't deal with over voltage and under voltage and you know electrical shorts and other things and then you have to add even more circuitry to add redundancy in case one of the transistors fails and so on so you've got this huge amount of complexity that exists solely because you've added more complexity and that just breeds even more complexity 
So I can't really see anything in there that isn't already in the 25B, which has purely passive components and was 50 years before that. As an aside, how do you mail a bomb fuse? Um, so this came to me as a, was it an antique electrical component? Um, well, the thing is, you know, you don't really want to label, send something and label it bomb fuse, because if everyone knows that a bomb fuse is like some sticks of TNT with wires and a clock attached to it, and this isn't that, so you just label it as an electrical component, and it is completely inert and passive. It's not like I'm sending something dangerous. You know, you could ship these things fully armed because there is nothing in there that will, it's just a bunch of capacitors and resistors. Um, alternatively, you can get it sent from somewhere like the Ukraine where you can just post anything and they don't really care what you're posting. <laughs> um, anyway, how did he fuse these things? So I've mentioned that this, these things were charged electrically and they then go into the arming capacitors. So in the same way that you, you can charge them electrically, you can also discharge them. So that's something called a Crabtree discharger. It just goes into these two brass contacts, pushes down on them, completes the circuit and the charge leaks, leaks back out of the arming capacitors. Um, and at that point, the thing is completely safe and completely inert. So this isn't, this isn't the cases of bombs that don't detonate. So some of these things didn't detonate because, again, it's impacting the ground. There's this enormous mechanical shock. And so in some cases, they, you know, they didn't detonate. Um, and again, this isn't necessarily a bad thing because an unexploded bomb is at least as bad as one that's exploded. So basically, you wait for the charge to leak back out of the um, arming contacts, and then the thing is safe. At that point, um, the theory is, if you read the manuals, it says you tie a lanyard around the fuse and you stand well back and you pull the fuse out. Um, the problem is the bomb has impacted the ground with a massive amount of force, and typically the fuse pocket is deformed. The fuse is now stuck in the fuse pocket. And so you basically attack it with a chisel and a hammer, um, a device that has trembler contacts on it that detonates if it gets any shock. And this only worked on the Type 15 fuses. Um, so they had a whole bunch of Type 15s left over from the Spanish Civil War, um, and they used those initially. Um, and then what they did is, because the civilians were worried about these bombs being dropped on them, they published all these feel-good stories in newspapers saying, you know, it's no problems, we can defuse these things. If you've got a bomb in your backyard, don't worry about it, we'll come in and we'll defuse it for you. Um, and the idea was to raise morale. The problem is the Germans were also reading these papers and they said, okay, you know, they know how to defuse these things, we'll redesign the fuses so they can't do this anymore. Um, the extreme example of this was the Type 50 fuse, which I'll get onto a bit later. So once they had the Type 25, um, which you couldn't use the Crabtree on anymore, they had the brass liquid discharger. So what you do in that case is you um, put, screw this brass container over the top of this. This has got all these amazing screw lugs on it, so you can just screw on this discharger. It's filled with meths with salt in it, so it's a conductive liquid. Um, the, you then force it, into, force it into the fuse under pressure, so you, you've got a bicycle pump and you pump this thing up. It forces this, this liquid in there. Because it's conductive, it shorts out the capacitors, the thing discharges, and then you're fine again. Um, and it required about a 30-minute wait. So you're sitting there on top, you're sitting there with this bomb, you pump your, your liquid into it, you get, retire to a safe distance, after 30 minutes you come back and you attack it with a cold chisel and a hammer and hope that it's not going to be set off. There's another fuse called the Type 17 clockwork fuse. So this is the sort of the detonate on impact or don't detonate and kill the defuser fuse. In combination with that, there's a Type 17 clockwork fuse. Um, so this has a standard electronic impact fuse in the upper portion, so it's basically the same as the 25B, and what that does is it, it, it then triggers a clockwork mechanism which counts down. So rather than firing the igniter immediately, it starts this clockwork mechanism, and it has a delay of between two hours and 80 hours after being armed, and at that point it detonates. So this is kind of the canonical ticking bomb. And this was often used as a secondary fuse alongside the primary fuse. So the problem with this is you can't actually tell what delay has been set. It's two to 80 hours. You have no idea how long that thing's gonna keep ticking before it detonates. So a standard approach was you wait 96 hours uh, before you start messing with the bomb. However, the Type 17 fuse had two particularly nasty failure modes. The first one, and again, remember you've got this mechanical, this very sensitive mechanical clockwork device that's being subject to a massive shock as it impacts the ground. So one of them is it stops on impact with the ground, it counts down to zero and stops. And then as soon as you disturb the thing, it detonates. Um, and the second one is it stops on impact with the ground and then it restarts. So these things aren't necessarily, you know, sitting on the ground with the bomb, with the fuse pocket face upwards. It might be face down in mud. So you've got to rotate the thing. You rotate the thing and suddenly the bomb starts ticking. You have no idea how long it's going to tick before it kills you. Um, there were bombs that detonated more than a year after they were they fell. So they, when, they, when these bombs fell, they assigned the various priorities. It fell into some very high priority area, like under a gas works or a railway line, or the example of the NPL in Teddington. Um, they were priority one, they defused them immediately. And then there were lower and lower priority ones. And some of the really low priority ones, 
it's you know out in the farm somewhere. They, they, they didn't bother defusing them because it just wasn't worth doing it because they had more urgent bombs to defuse. And so some of these detonated more than a year later. They'd get some sort of mechanical shock or something. The timer would suddenly start, count down again, and the bomb would detonate. Um, so the thing with the Type 17 is it contains metal components. So it's bronze and steel. Um, so the way you stop, you defuse this thing is you use a magnetic collar that goes around the bomb and lock the steel components in place. So what you do is you tunnel down to where the bomb is, and that's an actual photo of a um, bomb being defused. So you tunnel down to where the bomb is, you clamp on this gigantic me metal collar, um, you activate the magnets, and you sit there with a stethoscope and hope the ticking stops. So there's this thing called the clock stopper, also known as the Q-coil, and it was this 90 kilogram thing um, fed from 140 volt DC batteries. So you lowered this gigantically heavy thing around the bomb, clamped it over where the fuse was, um, and yeah, listened to it with a stethoscope until the ticking stopped. Um, at that point, the Type 17 fuse has been rendered inert, and you can then take the bomb away and move it to a safe location and work on it there, either to detonate or to, there's various other, way, other ways of defusing this thing, which I'll get onto in a minute. Um, Another fuse after the original blitz, so there was the main blitz 1940 to 41, and there's something called the baby blitz in 1943, and at that point they'd improved the techniques, so they injected a urea formaldehyde resin, which was a primitive type of plastic, um, into the thing. So they drilled into it, injected plastic resin, it solidified, and stopped the thing from moving. So that was, that was the, the, the main fuse, this was the 17 and the 25. Um, and then they were being defused, so the Germans came up with this counterhack to this. So in 1940, um, a bomb penetrated under an oil storage tank in a petrol refinery in Swansea. This was, a, this was a priority one bomb. It's a petrol refinery. You've got to stop these bombs detonating because the fuel is kind of precious. Um, they finally extracted the bomb. There were other bombs going off. So the guy who did this um, was in the middle of piles of burning petrol with bombs going off around him and somehow got this thing out. Um, and the bomb had split open. And there was something else under the, under the s underneath the gain that wasn't normally there. Um, it was called a Tus 40. And so what this did is it, it was under here and there was a firing pin, there was a spring-loaded firing pin that was held in place by the gain. When you pulled this out, the firing pin shot across and detonated the bomb. So they'd gone to strategy two of this bombing, which is you rig things to kill the defenders. Um, you can't withdraw the main fuse. The minute you withdraw the main fuse when you're defusing it, it detonates the bomb. Um, so any fuses, not just the Type 17, the Type 25, any other fuse that was used could potentially have one of these things inserted underneath it. So as soon as you, as soon as you remove the fuse to defuse the bomb, it detonates and kills the, um, kills the defuser. So the counterhack with this was you drill open the case of the bomb. Um, and I've mentioned that Amatol is, it's a really good military explosive. It's been used since before World War I. It's still used today because it, is, it has these amazing properties that it's really insensitive, it's really safe. Um, so you drill open the case of the bomb and you remove the amatol. Um, and the standard way of doing this is you use high pressure steam because it's so intensive, it's perfectly fine to do that. It melts the amatol, you then get the sludge of amatol and water that, that pours out of the side of the bomb. Um, and at that point, you still got the gain left in there, but that's about the explosive charge of a hand grenade, so it's not that much damage if it does detonate. Um, and some of these bombs, the biggest bomb was a bomb called the Satan, which was over a ton of explosive. And uh, that could take quite a while to actually sit there next to this bomb with a fuse still in it, steaming out a ton of explosive. And it was also used for discharging fuse capacitors. Um, so you force steam into the thing, the capacitors then malfunction and don't store a charge anymore, and then you can pull the fuse out. A slightly more alarming method is you can set fire to the amatol. And again, it's perfectly safe to do that. It will burn. So you use thermite to burn open the case of the bomb, and you set fire to the amatol, and you simply burn the whole lot. Um, and because amatol is, as I mentioned, it's extremely insensitive. Um, you can, it'll burn happily, it won't detonate. So you can, you can take a block of TNT and set fire to it and use it to um, brew tea if you're out in the field. Um, now eventually it detonates. Once the burning reaches the fuse, it will detonate. But by then most of the amatol is gone. So again, you get a very small explosion rather than a gigantic explosion of all the amatol going up. So the response to this was the Type 50 fuse. Um, this is really nasty. So the Germans apparently had spies within the bomb defuser community and knew all the tricks that they were using. So they come up with the Type 50 fuse. This had um, a split plunger. So with a Crabtree discharger, you push this thing in and you discharge it. This had a split plunger. So once you remake contact, if it's already been armed, you push the plunger in, the bomb will detonate immediately. Um, it also had circuitry where if you use the meths with salt in it method, um, it shorts out and also detonates immediately. And then they added some extra features. Um, it had an extremely long arming delay. 
So instead of arming, instead of arming, you know, while it was still in the air, it armed after the bomber came to, come to rest and had been at rest for quite some time. It wasn't a detonated on impact type bomb. Um, that was because the trigger was an extremely sensitive spring contact. It was so sensitive that tapping the case of the bomb with a pencil was enough to set it off. That's why you had to have this long arming delay to make sure it was totally at rest. So if anyone tried to dig down to this bomb or sneezed near it or harsh words or anything, the bomb would detonate. The sole purpose of the Type 50 fuse was to kill bomb defuses. And it was typically paired with a Type 17 fuse. So you've got a fuse that detonates if you sneeze near it um, next to a time fuse that detonates after a certain amount of time with an optional tools 40 next to it, which detonates if you try and pull the fuse out. Uh, the other thing was that because this thing had these really sensitive trembler switches, if you used the clock stopper on the Type 17 fuse, the Type 50 fuse next to it would be detonated by the magnetic field. So every single defusing mechanism they had at that point, apart from steaming out the explosive, was rendered void. Um, they also had naval mines, which are just as scary. They had this thing called the uh, BM-1000, which was a one-ton naval mine. Um, so they had magnetic fuse to detonate it, magnetic, sorry, magnetic sensors to detonate it when a ship went nearby. Um, it also had the standard LUTs, which is the, the, the standard 25 impact fuse. So if it dropped on land, instead of going into the water, it would detonate it on impact. Um, it also had a hydrostatic valve to detonate it, so because these things were dropped into the ocean and they were under the surface, if you pulled it to the surface to defuse it, it would detonate. And finally, it had a photoelectric sensor inside it, so if you drilled open the case and shone a light inside it, or exposed it to any kind of light, it would also detonate. Um, so the thing with this was, I mentioned earlier the Type 376 fuse uh, was overly complex. You had all this extra compensating circuitry to deal with the fact that this initially complex circuitry could fail. And that's exactly what happened with the BM-1000. It was intended for the Clyde, which, which was where the Scottish shipyards were, and it overshot and came down near Dumbarton. Um, the first guy, the first bomb defuser that encountered this, had never seen one of these things before, so he cut the side open and shone a torch in onto the photoelectric cells. However, because of all this extra complexity, the wires had come loose because of the shock of the impact, and so it never actually detonated, and that saved his life. Um, yeah, because the more complex the thing is, the more things there are to go wrong. So basically, the, the, the only approach that was left was still steaming out the explosive, because all the other defusing mechanisms had been bypassed. So then the Germans introduced something even nastier called the Type 50B or the Y fuse. So this wasn't in the main blitz, this was in the baby blitz in 1943. And again, they had that same problem that, that it's, you know, because it's electronic, you can add all these cool features, but it's now very complicated. And so there's a lot, a lot more things to go wrong. So it's, again, it's a standard Type 20 fuse, Type 50 fuse, which is already a horrible enough fuse to deal with anyway. Um, but underneath it were batteries and mercury kill switches in the X, Y, and Z direction. So I've already mentioned that, yeah, the bomb could have come to rest face down or fuse pocket down in some mud. So if you rotate this thing, the tilt switches are activated and the bomb detonates and kills you. Um, it's also got an anti-withdrawal collar on the base. So these things, um, it's, it's a completely smooth thing. So you drop it into the fuse pocket, you can pull it straight back out again afterwards. Um, this had an anti-withdrawal locking collar. So once this thing was in the fuse pocket, there's no way you can get it back out again. Um, there was a fuse captured that went under the Bakerloo line, which is a main railway line in London. Again, it's a type 1 priority, so that had top priority to be defused. Um, the secondary circuit was inactive because by this time they were using effectively slave labor to make these things, and these guys weren't terribly motivated to help the German war effort, so they often sabotaged the stuff that they were manufacturing. The secondary circuit on this was completely inactive, so presumably due to sabotage um, by, the, by the guys who were supposed to be assembling it. And it actually saved the diffuser's life because he, used, he assumed it was a standard Type 50 and used a liquid discharger on it, and that would have killed him. But um, because it had been sabotaged, it didn't work. So in this case, what you do is you target the batteries. And the thing about, the thing about these fuses is, you know, if you look at this as a black box, it's, it's kind of an, an interesting black box. You know, you charge the thing and then it fires. But what you do is you look at the individual components that make this up. So you've already targeted the capacitors. The capacitor has certain physical characteristics, so you move it outside the physical operating range that it's designed for. The same thing with the batteries. You don't just assume it's a black box with, with tilt switches. It's got batteries, and those batteries have certain characteristics. So you target those. And what you do is you freeze them to the point where they no longer function as batteries, um, assuming that mucking around with a bomb in that manner hasn't already caused it to detonate.
So what you do is you build a clay or plasticine dam around the fuse pocket, and then you pour liquid oxygen into it until, and this is purely rule of thumb, until you've got a one, um, one foot diameter frost ring all the way around the outside of the bomb. And that tells you that the batteries have been, hopefully been frozen solid sufficiently that they're not working anymore. And at that point you can use the standard techniques of getting rid of the fuse. Um, so typically it takes about two hours. So you're sitting there next to this bomb for two hours pouring liquid oxygen out of a dewar flask onto the thing until you've got your frost ring around the outside of it. And then you crowbar out the fuse. So the locking thing, you know, makes it more difficult to, to um, get out, but you know, it's a standard thing with brute force. If brute force doesn't work, you're not using enough of it. So you just apply a crowbar and eventually you leverage out bits of the fuse. Um, so the problem with this was liquid oxygen wasn't very portable. Again, this was the initial response to this. It took them a while to figure this out. They used liquid oxygen. Um, so later they used dry ice, which you can make on site. Um, and right at the end of the war, there was what was left of the Luftwaffe. They used an improved Y fuse, which had better low temperature batteries. Again, because they had spies inside the bomb defusing section, they knew what they were doing. Um, so they used better low temperature batteries. And that, so dry ice wasn't sufficient to cool them. They went back to liquid oxygen. Um, but however, that then halved the amount of time they had. So with liquid oxygen, they had about 20 minutes before the batteries started functioning again. With these beta batteries, they had about 10 minutes to get the fuse out with a crowbar. Um, naval mine fusing was slightly different, um, but they had the same kind of arms race with that. Um, so these didn't use contact mines, the so-called Hertz horns. These are really World War I. Um, these used a lot more sophisticated fusing. So one of the things they used was, I've already mentioned, the BM-1000 had the magnetic mine, so it detected iron objects passing nearby. So it wasn't based on the ship bumping into it, simply a ship going close to it was enough to detonate it. Um, so the hack for this was you had um, these towed electromagnetic emitters, this one they fitted to an aircraft. So you flew this aircraft at low altitude across the ocean, emitting this very strong magnetic field. Because a, an iron boat has a relatively weak magnetic field, so you can detonate these things remotely just by projecting a strong magnetic, magnetic field at them. Or you can dig out ships so they're not magnetic. The counter hack to that was um, you've got a counter on it, so it requires multiple activations. So what plane flying, flying over it once with a magnetic field isn't enough to activate it. You need a ship that's moving towards it, and you get multiple activations of the ship moving slowly towards the fuse before it will detonate. Counter hack to that one was the plane has to make multiple passes. And again, that was kind of effective for the Germans, because instead of just flying a plane over a sea lane once to clear it, you had to fly the thing back and forth 15 times before you assumed that it was safe for boats to go through. Another one was it detected ships' engines. So not just you know, any random noise, but specifically the sound of a diesel engine in a ship. Um, the, hack, the standard hack with this was you just depth charge the sea lanes ahead of you and hope that the shockwave detonates them, or you project out some kind of noise. Um, the counter hack with this was you require a slowly increasing volume, because again, a sudden pulse of noise is not a ship. A ship slowly increases in volume as it gets towards the mine. Once it reaches peak intensity, you then detonate it because you know the ship's right next to you. So the counter hack to that was you project noise out in front of the ship. So what they used was Kango hammers, which was basically um, pneumatic drills in this metal box welded onto the front of the ship. And they had this thing bouncing around in front of the ship. So it basically projected roughly the same sound as the engine in a ship, but at very high volume out in front of it. And so the mine detonated long before the ship ever hit it. So the stats for this were about 10,000 unexploded bombs, about 8,000 were defused, about 1,000 um, detonated, and about 1,000 odd are probably still down there. Again, because they're out in the middle of nowhere in some farm somewhere, and they're 20 meters underground. Um, so it just wasn't worth the effort of, of uh, digging them up. These things are incredibly reliable and long-lived. Um, some of these things are still fully functional after 60 years. There's an actual news story from the Evening Standard of a bomb that was unearthed in a construction site. And you know, they sort of dug it up with a digger and, and you know, rotated it, and suddenly it started ticking because it had one of these Type 17 fuses that had been stopped by the impact. It started ticking. And they used, if you read the rest of the story, they used classic World War II defusing techniques straight out of you know, World War II um, to defuse this bomb. So there's various things that help the defenders. And again, this is, this is kind of interesting from the computer point of view. It's you know, the sort of the black box versus white box. So all the fuses were very carefully labeled. That's a German military manual. Um, going into excruciating detail on, on how these fuses had to be labeled. So the bomb was labeled in minute detail with everything. It told the defusers exactly what type of fuse was in there. And there are very specific instructions. Um, this is, you know, it's, it's like you have to draw the letters in, in a particular height, in a particular font, and here is the German standard for the font that defines, what, you know, how you have to paint these letters on, and it's like a, I can't actually read that thing. Um, 
you know, 60 millimeter diameter circle with a five millimeter thickness and so on on a bomb that was going to be flown over to the enemy and dropped on them. The theory is no one really knows why they did this. It, it could have been just because they were German or it could have been so that if a, you know, if, if a plane came back and couldn't drop its bombs, then the guy, the armorer would know what sort of fuse was in there. I don't know how that mattered, but anyway, it made it very easy for the defenders because they knew exactly what they were dealing with. Um, the numbering was, you know, according to one military history, it was inflexibly methodical. You knew that if you had a fuse and it had a zero suffix, it was an anti-disturbance fuse, so the 50 and 50B. Um, if it was a five suffix, the 15 and 25 was an impact fuse, the 17 was a delay fuse, and so on and so forth. Um, so the 50B was actually marked as a 25B to disguise it, but then it had this Y after it, which basically said, this is marked as a 25B, but it's not, it's actually a 50B fuse. Um, again, why did they do this? Mark a type 17 as a type 25. Just confuse them to be really nasty. Um, so that was a, not a very good idea. Um, other requirements, again, if you read the German manuals, it's kind of neat. So it, it says things like, you know, the dents have to be smoothed out. If there's any rust on the bomb, you have to scrape it off. If the paint's damaged, um, you have to repair the damaged paint. Because what would the English think if we dropped a, a, a bomb with scratch paint on them? I mean, they'd be mortified. We'd be mortified. Um, other things that help the defenders, so yeah, if they hadn't actually carefully labeled these fuses, they would have had to x-ray every fuse in the field, and they actually did this um, with the anti-disturbance fuse, with the Y fuse, because they weren't quite sure what was in there. So they used radon, which is a radioactive, uh, radium-derived radioactive gas, um, and, and, and basically x-rayed these fuses and developed these developed photos on site so they knew what sort of fuse was in there. And again, that gives an example of how high value some of these targets were and how critical it was to defuse these bombs. That they were running portable X-ray apparatus and developing films of these bombs just to figure out what the fuse was so they could disarm it. And that became a standard practice for Y fuses because they were just too dangerous. You had to know what it was you were dealing with. Um, yeah, so they, they had the initial successes by the defusers, they were publicized, this helped the other side, so they stopped publishing any information about what they were doing. It, that didn't help that much because the Germans apparently had spies among the defusers, so they knew what they were doing, but still it slowed them down to some extent. Um, and then it was just sheer blind luck, the discovery of the, the, discovery of the TUS-40 was pure luck, the discovery of the Type 50B fuse was pure luck. Um, other things were side channel attacks from 1940. Um, instead of treating the fuse as a black box, you treat it as individual physical components and you attack the individual components rather than the black box. Um, you know, you heat, you heat the components, you freeze them, you basically move them outside the standard operating range and suddenly the thing doesn't work anymore in the way it's supposed to. In the case of the attackers, the decision to use electronic fuses was absolutely amazing. The, the Allies used um, like chemical fuses, so the time delays where they had acid eating into something and after eventually it detonated. Um, these were relatively unreliable fuses and not very versatile. The fact that he had electronic fuses and fuse pockets on the side, he had a lot of versatility. You could, well, relatively easily change the designs of the fuses to keep track in this, with this arms race with the people trying to do the defusing. Um, and you had the things like the impact change the operating characteristics of the fuses. The Type 17 was particularly bad in this, so that made them sufficiently unpredictable that it was dangerous for the defusers. Um, yeah, they took advantage of the fact that the initial success was publicized and they redesigned their fuses to get around that. So the thing, about, so the thing with the bomb defuses, the average lifespan of a bomb defuser was about 10 weeks. So if you were the person who actually did the defusing rather than the guy who dug down to the bomb, you were made officer grade because you had to have the ability to order around the guys who were doing the other work. However, you were never put through officer training school because you would be dead before you could actually use your officer training. And you know, think about that for a second, that's kind of a scary thing. We will appoint you as an officer, but we're not going to bother training you as an officer because you won't live to be able to use that capability. Um, if you want some reading material on this stuff, there's an annual fuse conference, which is now in its 56th year, and it's everything you never wanted to know about fuses. The recent highlights is um, use of lead-free solder in fuses. Um, because you've got to apparently be RRHS compliant. So you know that, you know, if your children are, be, are being maimed by cluster munitions and stuff, at least you know that it's lead-free shrapnel rather than leaded shrapnel. Um, and finally, your chances of me ending up on watch lists due to my research activity for this talk is probably close to 100%. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Do we have any questions? When I be here. You didn't show the ticking down red letters. When did they get added? I didn't show which, sorry? 
The red letter is ticking down, 10, 9, 8. When, uh, when did that get added? Uh, yeah, <laughs> only movie bombs. This is what they actually look like, not, not dynamite in red letters. Uh, just a question here. Uh, you remarked on the uh, regulations about uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, paint scratches and scratches to the, to the metal in the bomb casing and that kind of thing. That uh, seems likely to be more than purely cosmetic. Uh, I would have expected that that regulation would uh, exist due to um, uh, increased risk for corrosion of the mild steel casing. Do you think that's plausible or is it actually purely cos cosmetic? I'm actually getting almost 100% echo up on the stage. <laughs> Uh, we'll just try that question one more time. All right, one more time. Sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, do you actually think that the, uh, that the regulations about paint scratches and scratches on the steel of the bomb casing uh, was for cosmetic reasons, or do you think it might be to prevent uh, accelerated corrosion and possibly premature detonation? Well, so the, the paint wasn't, the, the bombs were painted and that was fine, but the, it was. Um, the lettering wasn't for protection, it was purely for labeling the bomb. And the, the instructions specifically said that, you know, you had to correct the lettering. It's, and even for rust, um, you'd only notice the rust as you're loading the bomb onto the plane. And it's going to be, you know, it's then got a half-life of a couple of hours before it gets dropped. So I, I don't understand, and, you know, I've read um, military history books where they also say we don't know why they did this. I think they were just being German. A, qu a, a question around the um, fuses that use transistors. Can you use EMP to um, diffuse those? So th that, the Mark 376 was one of the last of the transistorized fuses. They now all use integrated circuits, um, which makes them even more flaky because they're, they're more, you know, there's even more complexity and things to go wrong. Um, one would assume you could, however, to generate the amount of EMP you need to deal with a shell in flight towards you. Um, it's not really practical to do that in the field. Um, there was a really interesting history. I've still got a couple of minutes on this. There's an interesting history. If you read the history of the development of proximity fuses during World War II, um, they basically sent out a what would now be called radar, but it was lower frequency pulse. And if it was reflected back into the fuse, they knew that they were close to an object and would detonate. And the way they, they were worried that the Germans would capture these things and reverse engineer them and build their own. So they developed a way of jamming them, which broadcasts a radio pulse back at the fuse. So that's not necessarily EMP, but that was a way of dealing with the very early proximity fuses, which had no, um, you know, set pattern. They just, if they got a radio pulse back, they would detonate. Um, so early prox fuses could be detonated that way. Later prox fuses, um, they know that they've sent out this specific waveform, this specific series of pulses, and they can't be fooled that easily. So, yeah, for straight EMP, it's not really practical, and for effectively jamming the fuses, they're designed with anti-jamming capabilities, so you can't really do that either. We'll take a question over here. Uh, hi. Um, you mentioned that uh, an unexploded bomb is almost as dangerous as one that has actually detonated. Um, presumably, it's much cheaper to manufacture something that looks like a bomb, but doesn't, well, is never going to detonate. Um, do you think that's a reasonable strategy for an armed force to do to, you know, one in five or one in ten are uh, just things that look like bombs so that you cut down your operating costs so most of the, the most of the cost of the bomb was sort of machining the casing and the fins and all the other stuff so you've still got a you know the amatol is relatively cheap and they produce thousands of tons of this stuff and having something that's completely inert you still want to fill it with explosives so it possibly detonates at some point. I don't really know if it's, if it's worth the effort because it's, it won't be that cheap and you still want some explosive in it to do some damage at some point. And another question here. So they took a few examples, I suppose, of each of these bombs to, to figure out how to defuse them. How many examples did it take them to figure out these procedures and how reliable were they once they figured that out? Did they improve over time for repeated showings or did they still have repeated failures? That's kind of a longish answer. They had, um, it's probably best if I do it later because that would be a small talk in itself how they figured this out. They had a bunch of people like, there was a guy called the Earl of Suffolk who was this daredevil bomb defuser. He was, he was like the canonical mad scientist and he had this big stately home and he'd get these bombs wheeled into the middle of his almost palace um, and start mucking around with them in the basement and figure out these techniques. So 
some of it was, you know, rigorous research, and some of it was, was just these eccentric geniuses who figured out some of this stuff. He eventually got killed defusing some new type of bomb fuse that he hadn't encountered before. Um, so it was, it was a very British way of doing things. They just got anybody they could think of, anyone who could, who could come in and said, I'll have a go at looking at this, um, got thrown at it. Um, and yeah, some of it was luck, some of it was expertise. Like the Earl of Suffolk got better and better over time as he went from the simple fuses to the more complicated ones. And that's like computer hacking. You know, if you, if you were hacking 20 years ago, you had relatively simple attacks. And as the, as the defenses got better, the attackers um, adapted their techniques and got better and better. So with the simple fuses, the, the defusers got trained up on this. And once they had the experience with the easy fuses, they could work onto harder fuses that were deployed later. Um, but that, that's a very short version of a much longer answer. Are there any more questions? Are there any more questions? Well, let's thank Peter Goodman for such a great keynote. <laughs>